Hello everyone and welcome to this session of PCR TV and today we're going to talk about TAVI and specifically we're going to talk about valve selection in TAVI patients. I'm joined by uh, Professor Tony Walton who's one of the highest volume TAVI operators in Australia and was involved in uh, a number of the TAVI and mitral valve randomized controlled trials. I'm also joined by Professor Lars Sondergaard uh, from Denmark who's a world-renowned TAVI operator and was the PI uh, in the Notion low-risk TAVI trial. So in general terms, we have two um, types of TAVI valve available in the TAVI landscape. We have the balloon expandable valves and we have the self-expanding valves. And for most of us who've been doing TAVI for a long time, we remember the early days of TAVI where really the aim was just to safely implant the TAVI device. And we didn't think a lot about what was coming after. I think with the advent of low risk indications and, and really the increase in volume of, of TAVI procedures around the world, as well as more complex TAVI patients, um, the TAVI community has really moved to become a lot more prescriptive in the way we think about the heart team and, and deciding which TAVI devices we're going to use for which patients. So Tony, um, I believe you're going to tell us a little bit about um, the new TAVI offering from Abbott Vascular, which is the Navator device. All right, thank you, David. Uh, look, it's a real uh, privilege to be here talking today amongst my uh, very good colleagues and friends. So uh, I'm going, my task is to review the Navator system design and features. My association is that I'm the uh, director of the Alfred uh, Cardiac Catheter Laboratories at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne in Australia. We've been involved with TAVI since 2008 and seen uh, many of the valve devices uh, come and go over the years and they're really becoming quite sophisticated these days. Um, it's my pleasure to talk on the next generation uh, Navitor valve featuring this active outer cuff to mitigate paravalvular leaks. So, this valve has evolved um, over the years we've been using it and the current iteration uh, has, is quite significantly different from the earlier ones. Um, first of all, the uh, aortic cells are specifically designed to reduce risk of injury to native valve structures. And uh, there's this inner navaseal cuff that's also there as well, um, which uh, reduces leak. And the outer navaseal cuff is very important because it synchronizes with the cardiac cycle and uh, to seal and mitigate paravalvular leak. So the amount of leak we're seeing from these valves is actually very minimal. And no doubt Lars will address that with some of the data. The cells are large, and this is uh, very helpful in terms of minimizing coronary obstruction and improves coronary access and flow. And the radial force on this valve is also uh, improved in that we have better expansion, better anchoring, stability and sealing. And we also have a large sealing zone again to reduce the uh, risk of uh, paravalvular leak. The current uh, annulus treatment range is between 19 and 27 millimeters. So this is the collab data, which Lars will go into in more detail shortly, I'm sure, but uh, the 38 echo collab data suggested that the amount of leak from this valve was exceedingly low and there were no cases of moderate or severe PVL in 118 cases. And uh, we can see that this valve does uh, function very nicely. And you can see the active sealing cuff works around the edges here uh, to improve this seal and uh, mitigate any paravalvular leak, which has been the nemesis of some of the valves. The radial force has also changed and there is now improved radial force. Um, and so you can see between the 23, 25, 27 and 29 millimeter Navitor valves, the radial force is very similar. Uh, the greatest radial force comes from the 27 millimeter valve and uh, in the larger annulus there's slightly less force there, but nonetheless, this has definitely improved, I think the performance of the valve and it's been a significant step forwards. The valve hemodynamics are excellent and what we've come to expect from self-expanding valves and there's a large effective orifice areas and single digit gradients in this intra-annular valve and you can see that the mean gradients we're getting from this valve are between seven and eight millimeters of mercury and this is consistent with the other self-expanding valves on the market and certainly uh, considerably better than balloon expandable devices that we are using. The valve area is also excellent at around two centimeters squared across this range of valves. 
The uh, delivery system has also been substantially enhanced over recent years, and this delivery system is really, uh, really nice to use. Uh, the uh, profile is very low at between 5 and 5.5 millimetres, depending on the size of valve we're using uh, for minimum vessel diameter access. They are 14 to 15 French uh, integrated sheath uh, with a hydrophilic coating, and there's enhanced flexibility and greater deliverability. It's very stable during deployment. You can actually don't need a lot of pacing to uh, position this valve and it's recapturable, repositionable and retrievable. So it's a very nice system to use and it's also extraordinarily flexible and deliverable around very tortuous anatomy and I think it's probably the most deliverable valve on the market. So we move on to the decision making process when choosing a uh, tabby valve and this has <clears throat> become uh, more complex in some ways because we have a lot of interesting things happening. This is the uh, Recent guidelines that have come out from ESC, uh, which we just published uh, in the last month or so, and um, uh, it's interesting. This, this is, differs a little from the uh, European, the American guidelines. But now, <clears throat> all patients uh, over the age of seventy-five are recommended to undergo TABI unless they are unsuitable. All other patients, the heart team can decide what's going to happen to them between uh, TABI or SAVI, SAVA. And patients less than 75 at low risk for surgical valve replacement are unsuitable for TABI and operable are, are considered for a surgical valve replacement. So this is the broad range of valves we have available these days. And <clears throat> you can see the current generation devices uh, on the right hand side of the Sapien 3 and the Sapien Ultra. Um, and uh, the uh, older self-expanding valves, Evolute, Evolute Pro, Evolute Pro Plus, and now the Portico valve is intraannular here, and the older generation accurate Neos and the Jenna valve. Um, moving on from that, there's a lot of things to think about when you're placing a prosthesis. You need to think about your vascular access, optimal effective orifice areas are gonna be very important, uh, minimizing paravalvular leak, whether there's a suitable range of sizes for your valve, uh, how positionable and retrievable is it? And what is the long-term durability of this valve going to be? Um, the um, uh, balloon expandable valve uh, is capable of de delivering uh, very large annuluses beyond the recommended uh, uh, size for the manufacturer and can deal with horizontal aortas. There's high pre-procedural risk of permanent pacemaker implantation. They can be beneficial with extensive coronary artery disease and likely future need to access the coronaries is where balloon expandable valves may have an advantage. Self-expanding valves have the benefit of uh, dealing with dense annular and subannular calcification and those patients who are intolerant to rapid pacing. Small and challenging access is where it can also be an advantage and particularly if there's gonna be patient processes mismatch. Um, this is a little bit on uh, how to accurately place the valve and uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, it's very important to try and aim for commissural alignment. And there are techniques for doing this, which you can see here. And this is how the Navitor valve is positioned to try and achieve that. Um, you can see here that coronary access is excellent and uh, it's very easy to access the, the uh, coronary arteries in general through these wide cells that are available for both the left and the right coronary artery. There's a comparison here between the Navitor system, Evolute Pro and Accurate Neo. And you can see that Navitor valve really compares very favorably with small uh, vessel size and sheath sizes. There's this wide range of, uh, you've got four different valve sizes between 23 and 29. And we of course have the Titan valve coming. Broad range of annular sizes that we can use with a large cell size for coronary access. There's bovine pericardium and the polyethylene fabric for the cuff and the PVL mitigating uh, ax, uh, uh, access of this valve is very good and there's anti-calcification treatment so and it's fully recapturable of course so uh, just to finish up the uh, these are the comparative trials between uh, uh, the four valves and Lars will know that going to the data carefully but there's a lot of uh, data here suggesting excellent outcomes with low mortality low stroke rates and uh, pacemaker rates which are comparable to the other self-expanding valve systems. And the other important thing to remember is that the uh, Navitor valve has excellent uh, patient processes mismatch data, which is on a par if not better than the other self-expanding valves on the market. So there's many considerations when selecting a tablet device, uh, optimal device selection should be guided by patient specific, uh, anatomic specific and device specific factors, including likelihood of paravalvular leak, conduction abnormalities, coronary access and long-term durability with um, valvary intervention. Uh, thank you. That was uh, some very exciting data and uh, a lot to think about there for valve selection, um, I'm sure. Uh, Lars, 
I believe um, you're going to tell us about when a heart team should add a new uh, TAVI valve to their uh, prosthesis list. Thank you for that question. Uh, when a heart team should consider to add a new valve in their program. So we recently saw the new American guidelines from 2020. And for patients younger than 65, these patients should go for surgical aortic valve replacement and patient older than 80 years of age should go for TAVA. And then we have this, this very different, difficult group between 65 and 80 years of age, where both surgical and transcatheter aortic valve replacement should be considered. And the two factors which should be taken into consideration is the patient's life expectancy and the durability of these valves. So I would say moving to these younger patients with longer life expectancy, there's a lot of factors which suddenly become very important when choosing treatment for these. We know that pacemaker has been an issue and we used to say this was a benign complication after TAVI, but we now have strong evidence that both permanent pacemaker, but also new onset lift bundle branch block is related with cardiac mortality and hospitalization for heart failure. And for the four main valves in the market, we can see there's a different rate. And for the Navitor valve, it's certainly among the lowest uh, pacemaker rate after a TAVI procedure. And this rate can be even lower if we're moving to this new introduced cost overlap technique. Another issue for TAVI has been paravalvular leak, but we've seen most valves have now adding an outer sealing skirt. And with the Navi seal on the Navitor valve, we probably best of the class. So 80% of these patients have none or trace parvalva leak and the remaining 20% of the patient have only mild. So again, none of the patients have moderate or severe PVL after TAVI using the Navitor valve. Another issue going to patients with longer life expectancy is access to the coronary arteries. And we can divide all transcatheter heart valves into three groups, those with a low stent frame, those with a high stent frame, and for those with a high stent frame, it can be an intra and a position, such as for the Navitor valve, or a super and a position, as for the Evolute of the accurate platform. And we have seen data that if you have a super and a position, it seems that up to 20% of the patient is impossible to access the coronary arteries after a TAVI procedure. So keep that in mind when you choose your valve for patient with longer life expectancy. And finally, what's the durability of these valves? We know that self-expanding technology with super and position is of a much better hemodynamic performance and much lower rate of severe patient prestige mismatch than balloon expandable valve. But what's also interesting is that even with the portico and Navitor valve, in patients with small aortic anomaly, meaning that the annulus is 23 millimeter or smaller, the rate of patient prestige mismatch is the same as for super and position. So I think the Navitor valve is certainly capable to address these patients at a younger age with longer life expectancy undergoing TAVI. Let me just show those 30 days outcome from the next generation TAVI valve with an active seating skirt. So the first 120 patients included in this study was quite old, mean age of 83 years. And also the ST score was high, 4% combined with at least one frailty factors in more than 80% of the patients. So these patients were certainly both elderly patients and also deemed to be high or extreme risk for surgical aortic valve replacement. And for this study, we can see that the procedure mortality despite these elderly and sick patients was 0%. Procedural success was 97.5%, meaning that 3% had a slight migration of the valve and need a valve and valve procedure, but all patients left the cat lab with a Navitor valve, and none of the patients need to be converted to surgical or valve replacement. So the primary endpoint was all cause mortality at 30 days, and none of the patients, despite these was elderly and at extreme or high risk, died within the first 30 days. There was also a very low rate of disabling stroke, life-threatening bleeding, acute kidney injury, and vascular complication. The rate of new permanent pacemaker for patient at risk was 15%. But it's worth to note that out of these 16 patients requiring a new permanent pacemaker after TAVI, 13 patients had pre-existing conduction abnormality, such as right bundle branch block. And hemodynamic performance was, as I said before, excellent. 
Opening area was 2.0 square centimeter, and it was a one digit mean gradient, seven millimeter mercury at 30 days. And once again, with regard to Parvalva leak, top of the class, 80% of the patient had none a trace PVL, and the remaining 20% of the patient had mild. So none of the patient had moderate or severe PVL. I'm going to ask a question first to, to Tony. Tony, given that I think all of us, when moving towards treating low risk patients, are predominantly fearful of what will happen when that valve fails. And really, you know, if we're putting a valve in, what's the next procedure going to look like if we're considering a, a TAVI in TAVI? Um, when we look at this Navator device and some of these new data, it seems to me that some of the flaws of the self-expanding valves from the past have been overcome. Do you think you'll be more confident in putting one of these devices in to lower risk patients knowing that it's an intra-annular valve and therefore lower risk of, of having no coronary access? I think this is a really important question, David, and the challenge will be to maintain that coronary access. I think having two self-expanding valves inside each other are gonna, is gonna create a significant problem. So um, the challenge will be what's the first valve and what's the second valve in these patients. And uh, I don't know that you can put two self-expanding valves inside of each other you would make sense to go with a valve like the Navator is your first valve because it's going to give you the best effective orifice area, the lowest gradient and good coronary access. Um, whereas you don't really want to put a valve with significant patient processes mismatch in for a, a young patient. So my bias would be to go for the self-expanding valve first and then probably go for an, a sapien type valve as my second valve uh, to keep that away from the coronaries and maintain that coronary access as best as I possibly could. So that would be my strategy. I don't think we know all the answers. Um, the uh, durability of these valves is really important. We haven't seen uh, long-term data on the portico and Navitor valves yet, um, but it does appear to be very promising. Certainly our long-term evolute data is excellent. So I think <clears throat> the self-expanding valve platform uh, has good runs on the board already. And I hope the Navitor valve will continue to match that. And therefore we will see long durability out of these valves. Thanks, Tony. Um, okay, I have a question for Lars. Lars, um, I think with self-expanding valves, you mentioned the Achilles heel um, of some of these devices. The Achilles heel has often been perceived to be um, paravalvular leak and pacemakers. Um, in terms of paravalvular leak, does this Navisil cuff sort of change your opinion on, you know, what what your perceived expectation of of leak will be with one of these devices? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think we have seen the, with the first generation uh, self-expanding valves that you had a quite high pacemaker rate and also a high, higher rate of uh, power valve leak. But I think with this iteration of the stent frame and adding this active sealing cuff, it's been much better. It's also been uh, supported by a different way to implant the valve using this cusp overlap technique. So I think with uh, some of these self-expanding technologies, such as the Navitor valve, the rate of permanent pacemaker is the same as you see for balloon expandable technology. And once again, you saw that with this Navi seal, it's best of the class with regard to Parvalva leak. None of the patient had more than mild PBL, and most of the patient had none of trace. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for this session of PCR TV. Um, we heard from Tony Walton about some of the specific design features of the Navator device um, and also a little recap on some of the, um, the new guidelines for 2021 for management of valvular disease. We also heard from Lars Sondergaard um, the 30-day outcomes of the Portico NG study, um, as well as why it might be useful to add another valve to your armory of valve devices. Thank you very much for joining us.